as a director, I only get so much space to put in the titles and descriptions. And the actual title of this one is actually better than what I had to like shorten it down to. I, like, I just like the Bitter Harvest, which actually Bitter Harvest was all I could fit, would make no sense. So nobody would actually come and what is that? I don't know. Lemons? I don't know. So I, I, I like the real title. So next up is Ben Radford. I think most of you or many of you probably have seen him before. He is a paranormal investigator. Almost, that's pretty much his job other than writing. Is am I wrong? Sure. Sure? I'm just, okay. you're, just wing, you're just going along with my BS? We'll go with it. Cool. I've done it for years there. <laughs> so he's been involved with trying to figure out the origin of things like Chupacabra. He's involved with lake monster mysteries. He actually went out and searched for the Loch Ness Monster. He didn't find it, which I'm depressed about. If anybody's going to do it, it could have been him. He finds ghosts, hasn't found one yet. That means he's not good at his job. <laughs> but he did figure out that I have both my kidneys and nobody stole them from me, and he's going to tell you why. I, get, I give you Ben Radford. Thank you, Derek. I always enjoy a half-assed intro. It makes me, makes me feel good. Lowers expectations. I appreciate that. Very good. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah, we're, we're good. We're good. We're good. Uh, yes, well, thank you all for coming out. Um, I can... So, oh, there we go. Um, see you way in the back there. It is a little cold in here. Just so you know, that does help keep the kidneys fresh. Uh, so if it's a little warm outside, that's why. Uh, so we, we may be asking to, be don to have them donated there. Um, among my, the things that I do uh, in my investigations, I try and uh, take an interesting look at uh, everything from ghosts to, as you noted, uh, Loch Ness Monster, um, known for the Chupacabra, things like that. But I try to take it uh, from a folkloric point of view, among other things, including a forensic point of view. Excuse me. And, um, and so I've always had a fascination with urban legends. I've, like, when I was a kid growing up, I'd hear these urban legends. I always believed them because like, they're so weird and freaky. How could you not believe these urban legends, right? The Vanishing Hitchhiker, all these other things. And then when I began doing more actual research investigations, I, I sort of got more skeptical and, and sort of looking into the, what's, what are the, the, the folkloric themes behind them, things like that. Um, I'm a member of the American Folklore Society. Uh, in fact, at their conference two years ago, I give a presentation uh, on the folklore of the chupacabra, the vampire beast. As some of you know, I wrote a book on that. And actually, uh, later this year in November in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I live, I'll be giving a talk on this, this, this very subject, organ theft urban legends to, for, for folklorists. So it's, uh, it's always it's nice sort of, even though I'm not a professional folklorist, I've certainly done a lot of folklore research. And, well, when you're presenting in front of your peers, you really have to up your game because if you, if you say something bad, they're going to catch you on it. So this is a little bit, a little bit of a dry run. So if we have any professional folklorists, uh, uh, feel free to you know, correct me. Uh, I don't mind. So, yes, uh, the, the title uh, is Bitter Harvest, The Organ Theft Urban Legends. So l let me begin by actually just asking you, how many of you have heard some version of the, the or organ theft urban legends? Okay, so probably two-thirds of you. And the rest of you are like, why, why am I here? I don't know what's going on. Okay. Um, this, this particular organ theft, ur uh, or the organ theft urban legend, um, uh, it's fascinating for years. I wrote an article on it in the dun, 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 May, June 1999 Skeptical Inquirer Science Magazine, of which I'm deputy editor. So if you want to read an, uh, an earlier version of this, uh, it's in, again, May, June, 1999. And it was mostly on the, on the first subject, which is the stolen kidney. So there's actually, um, there's actually two main versions of the, uh, the organ theft story. Uh, the first one is the stolen kidney, and the second one is somewhat more ominously titled the baby part story. So here, here's the, here, and there's lots of, you know, in what, in, what in folklore we call variants. So there's, one of the things that happens about folklore is that a story will be told that's regionally adapted. So for example, uh, I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and so what will happen is that an, a version of this story, or the Vanishing Hitchhiker, or whatever urban legend, uh, well, I'll give you a good, good, good example, was uh, a couple months back, there were rumors circulating on the internet that, um, that people need to be wary of uh, uh, people who are going out to their uh, in shopping malls. That there was a woman who went out to her car at a shopping mall. And it was late at night, 
and there was someone underneath her car that, was, that uh, had a straight razor and they slashed at her ankles and she fell over and was managed to escape with her life, but barely. And I heard that about a local mall that's, uh, that's about 10 or 12 miles from my house. And I'd actually heard the exact same thing uh, a decade ago when I lived in Buffalo, New York, at a, another local mall that was about three miles from my house. I was like, well, it's, a, it's the exact same thing. It's, no, it's not me. That, that's clear. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I was out of town when that shit went down. I was not, I was not there. I have an alibi. But good, good question, though. Um, and so that's one of the things that's fascinating about urban legends is, is they regionally adapt, and that's one of the reasons that, that they have um, that they have relevance to people's lives. You know, oftentimes, people are asking why why do we repeat urban legends? Why why are they so popular? Why are they such a part of the fabric of our of our lives and our culture? And part of it is that the the themes about urban legends uh, often deal with um, with subjects that are important to us. There's not really urban legends about extraterrestrial aliens on other, on other, other, other planets. But the urban legends that people remember and that are repeated and spread by social media are ones that deal with, with morality. They're ones that deal with um, important subjects, uh, safety and, and things like that. Um, and so they're, they're you know, what we call folk tales, F-O-A-F, which is friend of a friend tales. You know, it didn't happen to me. It happened to my cousins, boyfriends, gardeners, third cousins, hairdressers, you know, babysitter. <laughs> And this is one of the difficulties, is when you're, in, when you're put in the position of trying to track down the origin of urban legends, it's this circle. There's, there's, no, there's no particular origin because they've circulated for decades, in some cases, centuries. Um, and so anyway, so here's, here's, the, here's, here's the basic framework. A businessman on vacation meets a, a beautiful young woman at a hotel bar. Maybe she's dressed a, a, in cosplay. Who knows? I think I saw a few last night. They flirt and go back to his room for drinks. The next thing he remembers is waking up in a bathtub full of ice and a note nearby saying his kidney has been removed and called to call 911. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, my kidney's gone. I, I'm, that's dramatic representation. Thank you very much. Um, so there we have someone screaming in a bathtub full of ice. Frankly, uh, you would probably die of hypothermia before you woke up if you're actually in a bathtub full of ice, but we'll, we'll be that as it may. Uh, down there on the bottom, there's a guy reading with glasses on. He seems remarkably un, unperturbed by the note he's reading, which says, Atten Atenciones, apparently this is in Spanish, your kidney's been removed, seek immediate medical attention. And so this is, uh, this is one, of the, one of the variants that we see there. I don't expect you to read the whole thing there, but this is a, uh, a one-panel comic from a, uh, it's called The Big Book of Urban Legends, and it was edited by a friend of mine, uh, Jan Michael Brunvand. Who's, uh, who's considered the, the, the grandfather of urban legends. He's now retired from the University of Provo in Utah, uh, but he's, he's written, I think, eight or nine books on urban legends. Um, and I've corresponded with him on several times, including on this. And anyway, just, just sort of, again, you don't read the whole thing, but it's, it's got two surgeons, and they're sitting there talking. Like, actually, it's, it's, I guess they're uh, medical examiners because there's a cadaver there. And they say, oh, you, you'll never guess what I heard. And so this is a true story. This guy meets a woman in a bar, uh, and they don't hear from him. They go knocking on his door, and uh, his friends break into the room. They find him unconscious and bleeding. We've got to get him to the hospital. That's when they turn, they turn him over, and they find a fresh surgical wound on his back. What the hell is that, they say. And the hospital, they found, yes, let me get this straight. You're telling me that someone's stolen one of my kidneys? Yes, yes, you were drugged, prepped, and operated on by professionals who run a black market in, in human organs. And it all happened in Central, at Central General, true story. Cool, so where do you want to go eat? So, a little, little doctor humor there. So, but, but we'll, <coughs> now, now notice, <coughs> excuse me, in this last panel, again, I was talking about, about urban legends being re regionally adapted. So we have these two doctors, and they say, yeah, it all happened at, at Park General. It's like, this is the place that they both recognize. It wasn't, oh, this happened 50 years ago in, you know, in, in Borneo. It's like, no, this happened recently in a place that this sort of provides a, a, a common reference, which gives it credibility. So that's one example. Uh, although there's many, many different uh, uh, types of stories, there's other, other ones that... Uh, that sometimes you know, there, sometimes it's uh, it's not an actual written note. Sometimes it's scrawled on the uh, on the mirror in the bathroom in, in lipstick, of course, just to add a little extra, you know, fear of women. Sort of like, oh my God, she took my kidney. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, call 911. And of course, again, none of this really makes sense if you think about it. I mean, if if someone wanted to take your kidney, 
Uh, again, they're not going to leave you a bathtub full of ice because you'll, you'll die before you wake up. Second of all, uh, you know, I think you'd probably figure out pretty soon that something happened because, you know, you're, there's parts of you are missing. Uh, so there's just the, 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 the credibility of this is sort of evaporates, but if you're th only if you're thinking about it critically. If you're thinking about it as sort of just a, a weird, creepy story you want to spread on social media or to your friends and neighbors, then, then there you go. So the, the, the history of organ theft stories is really interesting. Uh, one of the first ones, uh, the first one when people uh, saw it in, 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 the, in the media, was in the 1978 film Coma, uh, which starred Michael Douglas. Uh, and it was one of the first widely seen books uh, in films depicting organ theft. And it was actually uh, written by Michael Crichton based on his best-selling novel. I think Crichton went on to do The Lost World, if I'm not mistaken, and other ones as well. Um, and so you know, he's did, done a series, I think he's now dead, but he did a series of medical thrillers, and, and this was one of his most popular ones. And it's been a year since I've seen it, but it, I, I remember it well, and it was just it has all these creepy hanging bodies, and these they were harvested for their organs, and it all feeds into the, our very visceral fears of what happens to us in a hospital. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a second. So there's other organ theft rumors in films. Um, I've seen both of these. Uh, this is, uh, the one on the left is a, is a Brazilian film called Central Station, and it won a Golden Globe, in fact, uh, and it got two uh, uh, Academy Award nominations, in fact, and it's about, uh, it's set in Brazil, and it, it's uh, this story of this young boy, who you can maybe see there on the left, uh, and an older woman, and he's a, uh, a sort of street urchin, uh, I, th I don't remember if it was Rio de Janeiro or Sao Paulo, but he's, 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 Basically, uh, he's about to be kidnapped and sold for his organs, and she, he freaks out, and she helps him, and they, they escape. Uh, the one on the right uh, is uh, called uh, The Harvest from 1992 uh, with uh, Miguel Ferrer, Ferrer and uh, it's about a, um, a novelist who goes to Mexico, and uh, he's trying to write a book, and he sort of uh, stumbles upon an organ theft uh, uh, Kidney, kidney organ theft uh, ring, and uh, soon he's, he's in too deep, and they're, they're after him and his organs. Probably the most famous one, certainly the most, one of the most recent ones, was uh, Turistas in 2006, and there on the left is one of the posters, has a, a thin young woman there in a hammock with her kidney uh, having been taken, and there's another version there on the right-hand side. Another po version of the poster says, there's some places tourists should never go. Turistas go home. He has a scalpel um, uh, that's uh, about to take that out. And so the, the basic plot is you have these, these uh, attractive young men and women. They go to Brazil, uh, and they end up getting their organs uh, taken out. Now, uh, well, I'll talk about this in a second, but there's, there's a, if you'll notice, the three examples that I just gave, where were they? They were in Brazil in the case of Central Station, they were in Mexico in the case of The Harvest, and they were in, actually the third one was in, was in Brazil as well. And so there, there's, there's, there's a strong element of xenophobia, or fear of foreigners, uh, that's inherent in many urban legends, in fact, not just this one. There's also one, for example, of, um, of a woman, a California woman who goes to Mexico, uh, and she, she sees the cutest little dog uh, in, in, in Juarez. And she's oh, just the most adorable thing, this and that, and she, she takes the dog, and she, she gets it for, for sale cheap, and she smuggles it across the border, and she's just so taken with this adorable little dog. Um, and then she shows uh, her, her husband, who says, that's a rat! She's like, ah! So you have this, you have this, you have this it, it, it's fascinating when you sort of, when you, when you deconstruct these urban legends, because part of the story is that you have this stupid American woman who can't tell a rat from a dog. Frankly, I've seen some that look, could go either way, honestly. Um, but, but that's part of the story. The other part is, it's, it's fear of contamination. It's fear of foreigners. It's fear of those dirty, scary people across the border. Uh, because they're, they, they do things weird down there, you know. Go, 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 down, go down to Central America where, you know, where life has no value, where they'll, they'll take your kidneys. And there, there's a long, interesting tradition of, of, of the sort of uh, underlying, simmering uh, xenophobia and, and, and fear of foreigners uh, and, and, and in, in many of these urban legends, and, that, and I'll talk about that more in a second. Nancy Shepard Hughes uh, is one of the one of the top researchers in this in this field, and she describes rumors and, and urban legends spread throughout Brazil. And uh, it's uh, she's done work in Brazil and also in in uh, in uh, South uh, South America. 
uh, particularly Cape Town in the apartheid, in the post-apartheid era. And it, she's talking about uh, the, the abduction and mutilation of young and healthy shantytown children, uh, shantytown residents, especially children, who eyed greedily for their body parts, especially eyes, heart, lungs, and liver. Again, this, we're now into the, 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 bo the baby parts urban legend. Uh, and this especially their uh, eye, the, excuse me, heart, eyes, and liver, and the children would be nabbed and shoved into trucks or vans. Some were murdered and mutilated for their organs, and their discarded bodies were found by the side of the road or were tossed outside, wall, outside the walls of municipal cemeteries. So th these, are, these are actual rumors, and this is not, you know, it's important to understand that these are, these are things, these are stories that are actually believed in many places. This, you know, I can sit here and talk about it from an academic point of view, but some of these stories are treated and traded as this really happened not too far away. And it's important to keep this in mind when we're looking at this. It's easy to sort of look at it, again, from an from a academic folkloric point of view, and we can identify the themes and the parts of this, the folklore and the urban legends. But for many people, there's, there's real currency to these. And again, the other part of this, if you, the last line there, uh, the, other part, the other reason these urban legends are so, are so jarring to us is the disrespect, disrespect for the dead. Right? People are very, you know, they want the dead treated very carefully, you know, you know there's, there's rituals and ceremonies and there's cremations and there's funerals and, and this and that. And in this urban legend, these, these children with their, with their eyes and organs missed, missing are tossed out onto the street like garbage. It's no wonder that people, uh, the, the, these sorts of urban legends create fear among people. Another uh, top researcher in this area is uh, Veronique, uh, Veronique Campion-Vincent, um, and she talks about how, in some versions of this urban legend, the scenario is of pseudo-adoptions, in which children left poor countries only to die upon operating tables, not to be welcomed into loving families. It's commonly referred to as the baby part story, since organs taken from these children were allegedly used as spare parts in, trans in transplants. So again, the structure here, the idea is that there are uh, wealthy Westerners, usually Americans, sometimes Europeans, but almost always Westerners, uh, who go to the third world, oftentimes Latin America, Central America, uh, India, and Africa sometimes, uh, for the express purpose of adopting young, young children, three, four, five, six, eight, ten years old, exactly so that they can be killed and, taken, and have their organs taken from them. This is creepy stuff. And again, the, we, we can talk about these in the context of, you know, movies and horror novels, but many people really believe this. So here, here's a comparison of the organ theft urban legend elements. In the adult version, the, 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 the kidney theft urban legend, uh, it's essentially a, mor a morality tale about promiscuity. I talked earlier about, uh, about w w what is the role that these, why, why do people share these things? Why do, why do we pass along rumors and urban legends. Part of the answer is because it's, they're, they're inherently interesting, creepy stories. We like to creep each other out. We like to, this is why, you know, people share weird videos on, from YouTube on, you know, on social media. It's like, hey, check this out. Isn't this weird? Other times, interestingly enough, people do it because they're, they genuinely believe these things and they, they want to warn other people. Uh, I've, I've often come across people like, you know, you know send, Please pass this along to everyone who you know because this is really happening and somebody in your neighborhood may be trying to abduct children to take their organ. It's, so it's, it's meant in the very same vein as, you know, you know, please be careful, oh my God, this is, this, is a, this is a terrifying thing that's actually going on. The same way that, for example, if there's a, you know, a, an escaped killer you know, that's, that you know, the police are hunting in a neighborhood, you'll send texts and emails to everybody, everybody, you know, lock your doors, be careful. It's, it's the, the exact same idea. So in the, in the, in the adult legend, it's, again, it, it's a, there's different, different elements to it, but a big part of it is being a morality tale about pro promiscuity, because of course it's, it's uh, the idea is that, uh, well, you know, you, you, you should have known better than to go up to the hotel room with that beautiful young woman, because, you know, uh, you know, the wife is back home and you're, you know, you have a couple drinks and your kidney's gone. What are you doing, dude? Was it worth it? Was the sex that good? Because you lost a kidney. You hope so, right? Then we have the, the, uh, the, the child legend. Now this is, this is sort of a different flavor because this is not really a morality tale, except insofar as actually elements of it are, in that uh, the, the, the parents of these children are warned, you know, watch out for your kids. 
right? This is part of the story. It's the same with the, do you know the, the La Llorona story? I did, I did a, in my new, most recent book, uh, Mysterious New Mexico, I have a chapter on La Llorona, which is a, um, a woman who uh, goes around, she's ba basically sort of a, a ghost spirit and goes around abducting children and she's seen near waterways and, and rivers and lakes and, and, and uh, the, the idea is that when you hear her wailing, she's looking for children to abduct. And that as a parent, you know, make sure you tell your kids not to go near the water because if they're playing by the water by themselves, or of course, could they drown, which is the real reason, but La Llorona will get you. So these are sort of some of the, the, the agents of social control in the ways that this, this, these, these play out through urban legends. In the case of the, the child legend, it's essentially a xenophobic stranger danger theme. Uh, there's not really, you know, morality tale. It's, it's basically, look, you know, watch out for those evil, scary, you know, West, Westerners. They'll, they'll, they'll take your organs, they'll, they'll do whatever they want to you. In the, in the adult version, it's usually in the United States, uh, Las Vegas, Atlanta. There's, I've actually seen quite a few that, that talk about Atlanta. Uh, any, any major tourist destination will, will often crop up in these urban legends about where this sort of thing happened. New Orleans is often mentioned as well. In the child version and the baby part story, it's usually Latin America, uh, particularly Mexico, Guatemala, and Brazil. Uh, there's other versions in South, uh, in South Africa, for example, uh, but that's, that's, usually, that's usually where they take place. The adult legend is presented as a narrative or story. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. This happens, this happens, there's the scary climax, uh, and then the, you know, call 911, your kidney's gone, and there's a, there's a structure to it. In the case of the child, uh, the baby snatching or urban legends, it's presented more as a known fact. It's like this, this happens. Be careful. You know, watch your kids. This, this is a scary thing that's, that's going on here. Uh, so the, again, we're seeing some differences in, in how how these urban legends play out. In the adult legend, the victim is usually alive. You know, they wake up in a bathtub. You know, they're missing a kidney or whatever else. It's almost always a kidney in that case. Uh, although there are uh, there's other corneas. I mean, I guess you know. The, 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 whole, the whole note doesn't really work if they took your corneas because you're like, um, they left it in Braille. Call nine, one, what? Nine, nine, eight, nine, what? Uh, so yeah, they, they have pretty much has to be a kidney if you're, gonna, if you're gonna use that particular element of the urban legend. In the child legend, the, the child is dead. I mean, that's, it's, it's just sort of a, an anonymous, you know, this happens to kids, you know, every now and then it'll be identified, they'll say, you know, well, you know, little Pedro Ruggiero in this place, you know, he was found, but usually it's just sort of, it's interchangeable, it doesn't really matter. Who the specific child is, isn't really relevant. And in fact, the same, the same is true of the adult legend. It's, it's you know, it's, it's never, you know, the president of, you know, of, uh, of this local company did this, it's just sort of, sort of some traveler. In the adult legend, the victim is usually male. Now, there are, there are some versions in which the, the, the victim is female, uh, but uh, in most cases, it's male. And again, it, it feeds into the whole uh, femme fatale idea that, oh my God, you know, watch out for this and the, the whole promiscuity thing. And in the child legends, the victim's gender is irrelevant. It doesn't matter if it's a boy or a girl. The important part is their kidneys are being taken or their organs or eyes, whatever else, uh, and being transplanted. So it's not, it's not really relevant what they're uh, what the gender is. So this is all creepy and scary, but the question, of course, comes down to, well, is it true? I mean, we talked about the different variations, whatever else, uh, and, and it's all over the place. Again, we've seen, I, I could give you more examples of, of, of uh, appearances of this particular urban legend in films and fiction uh, in um, Mario Vargas, Vargas Llosa in uh, Death in the Andes. Uh, he, he wrote, uh, there's a reference to, to uh, organ theft in, in that book as well. So it, it's really all over the place once you start looking for it. And even though newspapers and magazines profit from these sensational headlines about vampiric organ thieves, the simple fact of the matter is there's no good evidence to support the idea that organ theft rings actually exist. Uh, it, it just from a practical standpoint, it's virtually impossible to remove a usable organ from an uncooperative donor and place, it, place them in a recipient. Uh, what the hell is going on out there? Dramatic. Dramatic. Okay, there we go. Okay. So here's, here's one of the issues, and, and people will say, well, why? Why is this so implausible? Well, uh, a couple reasons. One is that uh, you know, this is a, an organ transplant is not something you can do in someone's kitchen. I, you, you can't just, you know, you can't just do this in someone's garage. Uh, this, this is not how this works. 
Uh, if you talk to medical doctors, they'll, they'll, they're like, well, seriously, <laughs> people believe this? Well, yeah, they, they, don't, they don't have the background in this. So the fact is that sophisticated medical equipment must be used. You, you, can't, you, can't, just, you can't just slice and dice and pull stuff out. Donors and recipients have to be carefully matched. Now, this is a problem because, of course, you know, if you're, uh, unless, unless, let's say it's the adult traveler version, unless the woman says, so, what's your blood type, honey? Hey, baby. Okay, let me write that down. Okay. I mean, you, uh, unless they, the person knows ahead of time that this person's blood type and other histocompatibility tests or will match whoever they have waiting in the wings, waiting for this, this, this woman to go kill some guy in some hotel. Whoa, so where's my organ coming? You know, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm, I'm watching TV. There's nothing on cable. Where's my, where's my kidney? Um, you know, so it just doesn't make sense when you start breaking it down. Um, and again, blood and tissue typing and histocompatibility tests have to be done in advance and therefore with the victim's cooperation. You can't just pull out an organ and then say, there's not even, 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 if, the, even if you didn't even worry about the, the, the typing and the histocompatibility test, it, you, let's say you, you suddenly have a kidney. Okay, well by the time you've, you've figured out who, this, who, who the possible acceptable donors are, it's unusable. It, it, it just doesn't have that much of a shelf life. Furthermore, the operation would take between four to six hours and involve at least 10 to 20 support staff, including a surgical team, an anesthesiologist, and two nurses at the bare minimum. And the fact is that if you think about it, I mean, the, these would have to be you know, even, and now people say, oh, well, yeah, but you know, in Mexico, blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, well thank, I'm <laughs> glad you have such a low opinion of, of medical professionals in Mexico uh, or India, wherever else. The fact is that that uh, on some level, doctors are the same are all around the world. They're trying to do the best medicine they can with what resources they have available. And the fact is that, that especially in a third world place, especially in a place like Mexico or Brazil, you know, have, having, having that many people as part of essentially what's a conspiracy, is, it's ridiculous. If, if, they, if they were discovered to be part of this, this organ theft ring, they would lose their license. They would, they would probably be jailed. It's not in their economic best interest to be part of some clandestine organ theft ring. You know, they, would, they wouldn't risk performing such operations, jeopardizing their careers and reputations. It just doesn't make sense. So, so we look at, okay, well, how, how, do these, how, do these or, how do these rumors get started? And this is one of the things that I find especially interesting, is, is trying to say, okay, well, we found this, the, this story, and the question then becomes, wh where is this coming from? Why, why do these things circulate? Now, one of, the, one of them is that people interpret TV shows and movies as depicting real incidents. It's sort of, this is the sort of based on a true story effect. And I'm not suggesting that people necessarily overtly confuse a, um, you know, a, a film like Coma with a documentary. It's clearly not a documentary, I get that. But the fact is that, that and I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a story that relates to this. Um, about five or six years ago, I was, uh, I was watching a, a screening of The Exorcist. And it was sort of it was one of their re-releases. I guess William Friedkin remixed it again and put it out again, whatever. And uh, and so I watched the whole director's cut, blah blah blah, and they do the whole thing. And as we walked out of the of the screening of The Exorcist, um, I was thinking, well, you know, I remember it was kind of a scary movie, this and that. And there were two people in front of me, and they were talking. And I heard them. I was right behind them as we walked out. And one person says to the other one, she says, you know, you know that really happens. I mean, that, that's based on a true story, and that happens all the time. And it was fascinating to me because, because and they, they, she says, oh, yeah, I know, this and that, and, and then, you know, the, the rosaries, and they were going into the whole demonic, you know, Jesus casting out demons and possession and all that. But was what, what, what it brought home to me was the fact that we had just shared almost two hours of a common experience seeing a cinematic fictional film. I walked out of it. I happen to know quite a bit about exorcism and demonic possession, and I, I happen to know something about the, the, the st true story and everything else like that. I walked out of it thinking, yeah, that was a scary story. It's a fictional film, and yeah, it's a scary movie, and we're done. They saw the same film. They had the same experience, but to them, that was a fictional depiction of stuff that really happens. Understand that, the, 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 this is, the, think about that for a second. You know, and you know, just think about next time you're in a theater like that. That the, recognize that not everybody's interpreting these things in the same way that you are. 
And so this is, this is what I'm talking about. Like, for example, the, the movie, Coma, Central Station, The Harvest. I can look at that as, you know, you know, a creepy, scary, fictional depiction. Other people think, well, yeah, obviously, yes, these are actors, and yes, this is a film, but this, this actually does happen. So, so this, is, this is part of the reason these, these rumors go on, is because these aren't taken solely as fictional, uh, fictional depictions. We, of course, have sensationalized, ill-informed news reports. Um, and actually, uh, surprisingly, uh, social justice activists spread rumors about these things, including the World Organization Against Torture. Uh, I'm against torture. I'll, I'll go on record for that. I'm not a fan of torture. Uh, thanks, W. Um, but, uh, but no, I, you know, I, I'm against that. On the other hand, uh, there's a guy, can, guy named Eric Sadas, uh, who, who was a member of the, at the time, I think he was the president, he was a high, high official in the Organization Against Torture, who actually endorsed these urban legends. He, he, he gave a presentation uh, at, at the UN, I think it was, talking about how this is, this is a terrible tragedy, this really happens, there's all these children that are being abducted and taken, having their organs taken, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, dude, actually you're wrong. I mean, I, good for you on the anti-torture stuff, why don't you leave out the fictional stuff and, and focus on the real stuff. Another element is xenophobic rumors and gossip, and I talked a little bit about that earlier in terms of some of the underlying uh, you know, anti-foreigner, anti-stranger sentiment, and of course this goes back to things such as the, the Jewish blood libel legends, the idea is that, that, uh, that uh, Jews are using uh, the blood of Gentiles in, in their, in their, in their uh, Passover and other things like that. So there's, there's a long tradition of, of accusing other people of doing horrific things to other, other, other people's bodies. Kidney theft, organ theft, using, using blood, other bodily fluids uh, in, in these, in these uh, in these other ways. And interestingly enough, uh, organ theft accusations have actually been leveled for political reasons. So this isn't just sort of, you know, behind the back fence gossip. Uh, Todd Leventhal of the USIA, which is part of the State Department, the information agency, noted in a 1988 report that during the Cold War, uh, the KGB, the Russian intelligence uh, agency, actively encouraged and spread rumors that, uh, that Americans were abducting and killing children for their organs. This is one of the ways, this is, so again, this is, this is like official, it's official policy to, to remind people those, those Americans are going to take your kids' organs. So this is, this, this is, this is some evil stuff here. Um, and, and actually, in recent years, it's been, fa been fashionable in Russia, particularly, to, sens to sensationalize crime stories. I mean, it's, it's, it's crime is, of course, sensationalized all over the world in the media, but particularly with, regarding organized crime. Uh, and so anybody see the, the film Mute Witness? Okay, okay, we got one tentative hand of it. It's actually about a, a, a snuff uh, film, which is a related but different urban legend, but it's, it's, it's uh, set in, um, in Russia, if I'm not mistaken, in the area, yeah. And, and again, this is, so there's actually stories about, about the Russian mafia being involved in snuff films, and part of the reason is, is this, is that uh, dissemination of frightening rumors as to their power, which brings criminal organizations more benefit than harm because it demoralizes witnesses, victims, journalists, and law enforcement, and supports the criminal spirit of the rank and file members. So basically, the, the reason that they, they, they do these sorts of things, the reason they spread rumors that yes, you know, the Russian mafia will, will take your children is because they want to scare the hell out of you. It's like, you, you mess with us? We're gonna take your kid, we're gonna cut his eyes out, we're gonna sell it to somebody and make a profit of it. So it, it's, it's a way of instilling fear. And it, it's, it's actually pretty effective, so I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So another, another, uh, another origin of the rumors is misunderstandings of a confusion with genuine verified topics, including organ sales. Not organ theft, but organ sales. There's also the issue of inter-country adoptions, which are, which are admittedly sometimes shady. Uh, this is, again, this is one of, the, one of the periphery topics that you get into when you're looking into some of these urban legends. And you know there are cases where where children are actually sold by their parents. It happens in India. It happens in, in other places. Uh, but it's it, it's important to understand the context. It's not that they're being sold for their organs. It's 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 a matter you have you have poor uh, poor in rural areas, for example, poor parents who that's that's sort of what they do. I'm not justifying it, but that's you know they they, they sell their children off for 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 labor and, all, and other things like that. So again, it's not that they're selling them for organs, but they're, it's essentially a, a version of indentured servitude, which is a problem in and of itself, but it's not the baby part story. So let's talk about organ sales instead of organ theft. 
In some countries, selling a person's organ is perfectly legal. You can do that. You're allowed to do that. You can, if there's, there's anywhere where there's a waiting list, uh, as there often, as there, yeah, certainly has been for a long time, certainly regarding kidneys, uh, it, is, it, is, it is permissible in some places to offer your kidney. It's like, all right, what do you give me for it? I have two of them. You can survive with one kidney. There are complications, but you can, you can, you can live a healthy life with one kidney. You can have my extra kidney for X, Y, Z. Uh, in some cases, I was reading, um, Nancy Shepard Hughes had an interesting article in Cultural Anthropology um, about, uh, so current, current anthropology about 10 years ago, and she talked about how in some places, particularly in rural India, uh, kidneys are exchanged essentially for dowries. Uh, the idea is that if, you know, I don't have enough money for a dowry, but hey, you know, maybe we can work something out, you know, with a kidney. So this is the case in, in India, where adults voluntarily sell one of their kidneys. Uh, in, as in many countries, sophisticated medical equipment is rare, and in many cases, the resources simply aren't available to extract and preserve organs from those killed in accidents. I mean, there, there's always going to be kidneys and other organs, transplantable organs, um, heart is some more complicated, but kidneys, coronaries, things like that. For, because pe people, the thing is, look, if someone dies of cancer, particularly if they lung cancer, and they not, you're, the, essentially most of these organs are going to be unusable because they're, they're diseased. So ideally, it sounds ghoulish, but ideally, the best thing that could happen is, you know, a healthy 25-year-old college kid gets in a car accident, he, he gets his, I hate to be ghoulish, <laughs> he gets his, his head, you know, taken clean off, the rest of his organs are fine, they can go and harvest them and give them into recipients who, who can then benefit from that. That's the ideal position, but it, unfortunately, that, well, unfortunately, it doesn't happen often enough. That's, that's, uh, that's going to get me in trouble. That's going to get me in trouble. Can we, can we edit that out? Okay, we can. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm just going to go, we're just going to move on from that. Um, so the fact is that few, few Indians who suffer from kidney failure can, can afford a dialysis treatment. So they can either, they have two options. You can either die or purchase a kidney. Now, there, you can, there's lots of interesting debate about whether uh, organ, organ uh, donations sh should be mandatory. Uh, there's some people who have, there's some places have adopted an, an opt-out version where, where you're, you're assumed to be a kidney donor unless you say that you're not. Um, there's been d a debate here in, here in the States about whether it's a good idea to, to offer, uh, to, let, to let there actually be an organ trade, organ commerce. And you can, you know, there, you can, there's legitimate issues on both sides. Um, but again, we're not talking about organ theft. So here's another example of, of cases uh, of, a, of a high profile case. Organ selling made headlines in December 1989 when a man named, a Turkish man named Ahmed, I'm going to go over the Coke on this. Um, Ahmed Koch uh, claimed that three months earlier he had been brought to London with the promise of a job. When he went in for a medical check, he was given an injection, which he believed was a blood test. But he woke up the next morning to find a kidney had been removed. This made international news. I remember reading about it. I clipped it out of the paper at the time. Uh, and this was like, look, we have somebody who, you know, we have a name. This isn't like a friend of a friend of a boyfriend's gardener's cab driver. No, this is this, is this guy, Ahmet. We, we, know his, we know this is an actual person that's claiming he was a victim of a kidney theft. So this is one of the reasons it made such news. The problem is he lied. <laughs> this is where the wrinkle comes in. He lied. Investigation later, later revealed that he lied. He was, in fact, one of, tur one of four Turks who had gone to London that day and voluntarily sold their kidneys. He, he wasn't, he wasn't, this was not a surprise. He, he agreed. He, he signed a paper. Uh, he said, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll give you the kidney. Where else? The problem was he, he was unhappy with how much he was paid. He's like, oh, well, you see, I, you know, now that you got my kidney, I want an extra, you know, a couple, I guess it'd be pounds in, in London, you know, extra 2,000 pounds or whatever. And if you don't give it to me, then I'm going to tell everybody that you stole my kidney. Well, this didn't work out for him. Uh, but that's what he tried to do. He tried to bas basically blackmail uh, the, the people who's, who, who he'd sold his kidney to. Uh, as it turns out, even though, uh, even though the, the organ trade was legal at the time in London, uh, several of the surgeons who were involved in this uh, were disciplined, and I think one or two lost their license. So e e even though this was, I mean, you can, you can talk about the ethics about it, but it, it was legal at the time, uh, and, but it, it caused such a stir that the British Medical Association was freaking out about it. 
And occasionally you do see stories about uh, or Indian kidney thefts. Uh, I've seen several versions of this photograph on the right where the, you have these, these Indian men who are showing these, these surgical incisions where their kidney was, was taken from them. The problem is that all we're seeing are scars. Um, I, I don't doubt their kidney scars, but uh, the scar looks the same whether they agree to donate the kidney or they were taken from them. <laughs> Just, it looks very scary and dramatic. Oh, look, my kidney's gone. Well, did you sell it? Well, <laughs> if you sold it, then it wasn't stolen, right? That's how that works. So that's one of the things you see. So here's another fascinating element of the story, is that uh, in, in Mexico City, uh, over the past uh, 20 years or so, there was, there's, been, um, there's been dozens and actually, depending on who you talk to, hundreds, but certainly dozens of women who have been killed uh, in, in a place called Matamoros, uh, not far from, Mex from, from Juarez, near the, the, near the border. And um, no one knew what was going on. Some people thought there was a serial killer going on. Other people thought it was a, a, a gang related because of course Mexican, uh, there's lots of problems with the, the Mexican gangs, particularly the, the Zetas who are known for beheading people. Uh, and some, sometimes they'll actually cut off their hands and, and, and legs to, to, to scare the other people, to, the, the rival, drug, uh, rival drug members. But uh, this is one of the theories um, uh, from 2003 that these women had had their organs harvested from them and that this was this is what happened to them. Uh, as it turned out, that's completely wrong. I mean, there's, there's, there's no evidence whatsoever that the missing women uh, in Juarez, Mexico, had their organs taken from them. But, you know, again, this is, this is how rumors percolate and become mainstream news, is that someone, someone suggests it, even sort of, you know, not, not joking, but just sort of like, well, these, these are the, all the wild theories we're talking about. And the press says, oh, did you mention that organ theft thing? We're going to go with that. So the, the, more, the five more likely explanations are ignored in favor of the creepy sensational one that then makes the, makes the headline of the Albuquerque Journal. So let's, let's move this, let's move this to, to, uh, to more current times here. Anybody know, anybody know the story? The, the, okay, all right, this will be interesting. So here's what happened uh, to an Asian couple uh, from Los Angeles. Let's see if I have a nod. Oh, let's go with that. All right. An Asian couple from L.A. with adopted African children went on trial in Qatar in November 2013. They were accused of starving their daughter Gloria to death in order to sell her organs. This is not 1978. This is not 1983. This was last year. The New York Times said the Qatar police investigators, in the report of Gloria's death, they were actually the, 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 uh, they'd actually adopted two young children, I think from uh, Nigeria, Liberia, I forget which, but from, uh, from, uh, from West Africa. And the, the, the youngest one, Gloria, had died. Uh, found the family circumstances highly suspicious and wrote that the girl had been emaciated. The defendants, they concluded in an investigation, quote, participated with others in child trafficking most likely to either sell organs or to conduct medical experiments on them. This is a police investigation conclusion report. This is not Snopes. This is, these are, these are presumably intelligent, well-placed police can coming to this conclusion. There they are. There's uh, uh, Matthew Grace Wong, the little girl in there in the middle is uh, Gloria. And part of the reason that this, this all happened, and again, this, this goes back to what Shepard Hughes was talking about, about the, the inner country adoptions. This is, this is one of the versions that the, the, organ led, the organ theft story goes, is that, I mean, it's, it's, right, it's right there, textbook. This is, this is out of folklore books. And the Qatar courts, they, they apparently never heard of it, never talked to me, never talked to anybody else, and so these, these people were put on trial. And one of the reasons, by the way, is that uh, mixed racial adoptions are virtually unheard of in Qatar. It's just, that's just the weird, they, they're like, what is this? We've got Asian and two black kids, what, how, what other reason could they possibly have, if they're not gonna take these kids' organs, why are they adopting these black kids? <laughs> that's the only reason we can think of. It's cl there clearly is no other, it just, so this, this is where, where they go with it. It's absurd, it is absolutely patently absurd. And I actually wrote about this for, for Discovery News because I, Again, knowing a lot about the subject, I wrote, I, I need to tell people, like, look, this is the context. This is, this is what these people are saying. 
you know, by starving their daughter to death, they would be damaging the very organs they're trying to sell. It doesn't even make sense. This, this poor girl died, and actually the, the, the most likely explanation is that uh, when they were adopted, uh, particularly Gloria, the, she had eating disorder. It wasn't anorexia, but it was similar to anorexia. So she wasn't getting enough nutrition because that's how they, they grew up, you know, virtual with, without enough food. So then she, she continued to have these, these eating, eating problems. She died emaciated. And then they blamed uh, the parents for, for little Gloria's death when, oh, we're going to take her organs. Well, the fact is that, you know, it, the, 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 the dying of starvation is going to harm the kidneys, livers, lungs, and heart, other vital organs. You're supposedly trying to get out of the, the little girl anyway. If someone was truly wanting to take uh, Gloria's organs, she, her death would have been quick so that her, and done under medical supervision so they actually could have taken her organs and it was, so that it would have been usable. It just doesn't, none of this makes sense. Here's another case. Again, sort of talking about the ways in which these urban legends rise to international news. So it's, again, we're not just talking, you know, urban legend stories, you know, spread on social media. This is, this is, this is what people are talking about. In late 2000, new, a news story came out of Russia. Again, remember what I said about Russia. A grandmother was arrested for trying to sell her five-year-old grandson, Andre. Police said that uh, the grandmother was, uh, told the boy he was going to Disneyland. But no. Disneyland by way of death? <laughs> by way of the morgue? He was handed over to a man in exchange for $90,000. The story is more than just a tragic tale of a child sold for slavery or prostitution. He was sold to a man who would then take him to the West, presumably America, who knows, where his kidneys or other organs would be, uh, would be taken. Again, this made international news. Uh, this was a, there's a piece on CNN there, uh, and also the, the, oh, that's not the Daily Fail, that's independent. Um, so again, you know, this is, this is how, and keep, keep in mind, I was talking about the origins of these things. So what happens is the people who believe in this, they're like, it's on CNN right there. Russian grandmother want to sell child for organs. It, it happens. It must. It, it, it's right there. They, they couldn't print it if it weren't true, right? I mean, it's right there. Well, the fact is that the, the grandmother almost certainly sold the child in, in an illegal but common adoption plan. The, the, the whole details of the organ theft and the kidneys and all this, they were added by the press. It was sensationalized news reporter trying to make a story out of a essentially non-story. Uh, Nancy Shepard Hughes, who's a professor of anthropology at UC Berkeley, and uh, again, she's one of the top experts on this, uh, said, she was interviewed by the BBC, she said, my understanding is the grandmother was willing to hand over her grandchild for a cash payment, but it was, it was a paid international adoption deal, not for organ trafficking. That was never, nobody ever said that. She didn't say, no, <laughs> that was made up by the press. And, and this woman, you know, is now being vilified for that and was accused of this. So unlike freaky or funny urban legends about vanishing hitchhikers, microwave poodles, giant alligators living in sewers, rumors and urban legends about organ theft have very real consequences. This is one thing I try to impress upon people is that, is that folklore is all around us. Urban legends are all around us. They're, they're part of our lives, whether we, whether we realize it or not. And in many cases, organ theft rumors can have very real consequences. Here's some of them. Decreased organ donation. In places where these urban legends circulate, people don't donate organs. Why? Because they're concerned that if they go into the hospital, they're going to have their organs taken from them anyway. They're, they stay the hell away from there. Same thing with, with point two there. They avoid needed medical treatment. This is especially true in, in rural, uh, in, in both rural and urban uh, Brazil, major cities like Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. Residents will avoid going to the public hospitals because they're concerned if they go under, they're not going to wake up, or they'll wake up missing a kidney. That's how, that's how afraid they are. So, so they don't go in for medical treatment. They may, they may badly need medical treatment. They're like, I'd rather deal with whatever this, this growing tumor is because I'm, I'm going to die if I go in the hospital because they're going to take my organs. So there's real damage done here. It gets worse. In May 2000, in rural Guatemala, a Japanese tourist and a Guatemalan bus driver were stoned and beaten to death. One of their bodies was actually set on fire after accusations emerged that the group were looking for children to abduct for their organs. They were beaten, stoned to death, and one of the guys' bodies was burned in a mob. 
I remember, I remember the story when it first came out. Just a few months ago, Sao Paulo, Brazil, a woman was beaten to death by a mob who accused her of seeking children to abduct and take, for, take their organs for black magic. I, I wrote about that for, for, uh, for Life Science. In fact, that's my piece right there. This is May of this year. This isn't 1600s. This is 1983. This is still going on. People, people, these stories, got, and what, what happened in this particular case was that, uh, I talked earlier about how the, these things were spread around. One of them was that um, the idea was that uh, the, the, it was a Facebook page, and it was a local Facebook page for local uh, news agencies. Like, watch out, you know, this is scary, it's sensationalized stuff. So they were sending warnings out. Watch out for this, this woman is walking around trying to abduct children, and they saw this, and like, oh my God, that's her. They attacked her, and, and they ended up killing her. They, it was a hor really horrible story. Um, and, to wrap it up, the uh, Qataric uh, court found those, that American couple guilty in the death of their daughter. Matthew and Grace Huang, who I mentioned a, a little while ago, they're found guilty. So they're, uh, they're now facing, um, I think, three years in prison because this judicial court in Qatar can't be bothered to ask any experts on urban legends or folklore as to whether there's any validity to this whatsoever. Hopefully they'll, they'll, uh, they'll get appealed. Anyway, there's more resources in urban legends. Uh, there's Media Myth Makers, one of my books, another one uh, that I co-author with Bob Bartholomew. Uh, there's interesting stuff on there, and there's a couple more resources. Uh, there's Jan Bruinvan's stuff, Gillian Bennett's book, Bodies, Sex, Violence, and Death in Contemporary Legend. Uh, there's Nancy Shepard Hughes' piece on uh, global traffic in human organs. And the best of all these is probably uh, Organ Theft Urban Legends, uh, 2005, by, by Veronique Campion Vincent. So I think we have some time for Q&A. If anybody has anything, I will pause for applause. I will pause for, there we go. God. Like pulling teeth with you people. Hey, ben, yes, thank, hi there. That was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate um, that. So, would you discuss some of the, I think, good heavens, Mark. <laughs> um, but would you discuss some of the um, goings on that we hear about coming out of Africa where some of the albinos have been killed for their body parts, for folk medicine, things like that? Yes, I, I, thank you for bringing that up. I, I was actually going to include that in my talk. I just, I was, I was, there's, so much, there's so many fascinating elements to this, I, I couldn't fit it in the, in, the, in, the, in the slides here. What she's talking about are what's called Muti murders, M-U-T-I. Uh, and anybody here see the movie District 9? Okay, that, there's actually, there's a scene of, of, of a Muti murder, uh, an attempted Muti murder in that section. There's a part where uh, he's taken to a witch doctor and they're going to cut off one of his, I think one of his hands. Uh, what happens um, in many parts of Africa, particularly uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, is that albinos are persecuted because they believe that their body parts are magical and they, they can be used in magical rituals. Uh, and uh, according to the Red Cross, thousands and thousands of, of African albinos are murdered. I mean, not just, I mean, they're, they're, they had their limbs hacked off by machetes and they're left, left to bleed to death, men, women, and children. Uh, and these body parts are taken, uh, taken for that. So that's, and, it, it's a, and I've written about it several times, and it, it's, just, it's just horrific that, you know, this, these are one of the problems with, you know, the, with belief in magical thinking. This is one of the things that people need to remember is that these, these sorts of rumors and stories do have consequences and they harm real people. Um, so anyway, it's, it's, again, it's, it's multi murders. Uh, it's still happening in Africa. There's a, there's, a, there's a Canadian albino businessman who started a... Um, who started a, a nonprofit group? I think it's called um, it's, uh, under under the same sun. I think it is, and it's 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 dedicated to helping African albinos uh, get away from that. Yeah. What about uh, Chinese prisoners that have been condemned to death? Uh, I've heard reports that uh, their uh, organs have been harvested. Yes, you're exactly right. Uh, that's in the case of um, there. There have been essentially confirmed reports that Chinese prisoners uh, have been executed. Uh, uh, specifically for their organs. So, for example, they'll be, they'll be, you know, they'll be executed at, you know, nine o'clock at night, and the next morning their their organs are in three other people's bodies. Um, the, the, there's been pressure put on the Chinese government to end that, and they have, from what I understand, they they sort of do international pressure. They sort of dialed that back. One of the concerning issues is that 
is that in, in, the, in, the, in, among, in Chinese government, they've actually c expanded the list of crimes that are, uh, that are capital crimes. And part of, the, part of the concern is they did that so they get a, a, a bigger pool. I mean, if you, if you make you know, a parking violation a capital crime, you got more organs. Uh, so yes, that, that does happen. Um, and again, that's, that's part of the, the, the organ trade. Do you think uh, any part of this legend can be traced back to the uh, Jack the Ripper mur uh, murder of Catherine Eddowes, where he uh, was able to kill her in Myers Square, take uh, one of her kidneys or half of her kidney in uh, less than 10 minutes, given that the Ripper was believed to be both a doctor and a Jew? Do you think there's anything that from that point forward kind of push this legend to develop? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question about, about Jack the Ripper. Uh, you know, I, I, I did know that. Um, I. I'm not sure where that, that would fit into the urban legend stories per se. I mean, it certainly, it certainly ties in with some elements in terms of, you know, the, the organ being taken. Uh, but again, that would be essentially be more of, um, you know, the adult, the adult, you know, the, you know, the body part theft. But again, it doesn't really fit the mold because she was clearly a victim. She wasn't, she wasn't you know, unless well, yeah, she met she Jack in a bar and they're like, hey, right. do you fancy a shag, honey? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Could you share your thoughts on some of the more recent films about organ repossession? So there's like Repo, the genetic opera, and there's Repo Man, things like that. Do you think that would be more of a, a modern day, more technological version of organ theft? I, I missed the first part of the question. Yeah, can you share your thoughts on that? So uh, it's kind of, you know, like a contract, like you purchase an organ, and then it's repossessed because you can't keep up with payments, things like that. Can you share your <laughs> right, thoughts right. on that? Yeah, you know, there was actually, a, there, was a, there was an awesome, um, anybody remember Max Hedrum? Yeah. There we go, thank you, thank you. There was, there was, that, there was a, a, a Max Hedrum episode called Body Banks. Uh, had uh, two, uh, two grave robbers named Bruegel and Mahler. Uh, that were, uh, there's an episode sort of about that. Uh, anyway, I just want to plug for Max there. Um, yeah, I, it, it's, it, you know, when you have these sorts of stories, like this is, I, I, I find that sort of fictional treatment fascinating because like, wh what do you do? It's like, you know, if you, presumably the idea is that, that you know, if you transport an organ to someone else, it's, it's theirs, like it's mine. It becomes an integral part of you. But of course, then the question is, well, how many, and there's even, you know, there's lots of stories as you may have seen where, you know, the, the idea is that, you know, if a, if, a, if a heart of a hunter is placed into a, you know, a, a vegan, you know, what, do they suddenly crave blood? You know, it's, there's all sorts of ideas of, you know, of, of tissues and memory and personality being transplanted along with, with the blood and everything else like that. So it's an interesting story. I hadn't really thought much about it. Hi. Um, I was thinking about the adult stories, the mm -hmm. adult versions, um, and thinking about the movie Hostel and in general yes. the kind of uh, folklore of the evil innkeeper who, you know, tricks the, you know, un unwitting guests into being tortured or something along those lines. And I was wondering if, if that's actually its own kind of subgenre or if, like, um, those tales kind of take on whatever, like, an organ donor or, like, a rich person who just wants to torture people or some, you know, kind of, or if, if if those are yeah. at all kind of a universal thing in them in and of themselves. Yeah, I I, would, I, I actually I'm not I'm not a big fan of the, the torture porn right, stuff. It just right. doesn't I don't I don't find it interesting or really very good. But uh, but yeah, I, I think that I think that it it it, it it's similar to it in that you have there, there's a there's an element of conspiracy to it. Because that's that's essentially what the what you know what all these are about, right? There's a conspiracy for people who are trying to get you, you know, on a slab to take your kidneys. There's a conspiracy that there are people are going to try to abduct your children, take their organs out. And who are conspiracies run by? Conspiracies run by powerful people, powerful entities, corporations, and or you know cer certainly someone bigger than yourself. And if you're in a foreign country, you're at their mercy. You're, you maybe don't speak the language. You know they they can they can rip off your passport, your visa. You're under their control to some extent. So I think there's not a direct connection to the organ theft legends, but there's it's certainly sort of a, a sort of tangential uh, you know, subgenre. So and, and yeah, I mean, and there's there's stories of that going back, you know, you know the, again, it, it, it's the whole xenophobia part of it. So, we'll probably have time for one quick question. It was fast. Oh. Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, mine's a bit long, but personal story and a uh, question. Do you have both so, kidneys? Just so we're clear. Yes. Okay. Thankfully. All right, because so, this is um, going to get suddenly go south. Like, oh my God. Yeah. No, like, we're good. 
But um, so my family's from Puerto Rico, and when my great grandmother had her first son, he was born on a full moon. And the doctors, this is like our big family mystery, basically. And the doctors never showed him to her and took, never, yeah, and took him away, saying he was like terribly deformed because he was born on a f full moon. And everybody in my family thinks that they like took the child to sell. Uh, any thoughts? Like, because we never really. Where's your family from? Puerto Rico. Uh, very, uh, very rural. There's weird rural stuff in Puerto Rico. Sound. I've been there. Yeah, yeah, there, there is. Um, no, no offense, but. <laughs> Not taken. Uh, that's. That's an interesting story. I'd like to hear more about it. I mean, you, there, it's one of those, you, that, that, your story is interesting because it combines a lot of elements of the, the whole switch to birth thing, mm -hmm. you know, like the man the iron mask story, like where you know, there's, there's someone who comes up and who are they important or whatever where, where, where happened to them. Uh, yeah, it's, it's I, 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 without knowing more about it, I can't comment on it, but it seems interesting. Tell me more about it afterwards. All right. I think we are at end. Uh, thank you very much for coming out and listening to me. Um,